All right, good morning. So um, this talk, uh, for those of you who've been uh, at the conference throughout, this will be a bit different. Uh, no neuroscience uh, will be used. No animals will be harmed in the process of giving this talk. Um, though the, um, when uh, Piotr and, and Georg invited me to come, uh, and we talked about potential topics, said, well, what about some on ethics? So my first love is metaphysics and human nature, pretty much viewed through the lens of Thomistic philosophy. Uh, but as you've heard, that sort of led me into bioethics, uh, particularly questions about beginning and end of, of human personhood and, and issues related to that. So um, I you know, want to give a new and original talk. And so you know, my idea for this talk was, why do we value persons? Why, oops. Why do, there we go. So, you know, we always talk about you know, personhood and when is a human being a person and are all human beings persons. You know, what's so special about being a person? So that's kind of the, the background question that led me into this talk. Um, I don't know if, if this phenomenon has made it over here yet, but some of the young people in the room may be aware. In the U.S. right now, a major pop culture phenomenon is the uh, hit Broadway musical Hamilton uh, about the, one of the uh, United States' founding fathers. Uh, it's a hip-hop telling of his biography, which is what made it really popular with the young people. Of course, one of Hamilton's uh, nemeses, both in the play and historically, is Thomas Jefferson, who is the famous author of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. And in that document, Jefferson proclaims uh, the Enlightenment thesis, pretty much under the influence of John Locke, quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, read strictly, one would think that Jefferson meant to exclude women from equality. And given the fact that women did not enjoy full political rights until much later in our country's history, um, actually not until 1920, um, maybe that's true. Maybe that was Jef Jefferson intended. Um, or perhaps he just meant men in the standard translation of the Latin term homo, as in homo sapiens. As a matter of historical fact, however, Jefferson himself owned numerous slaves and even wrote, quote, notice I'm quoting Jefferson, of the inferior mental capabilities of blacks, of the superior sensibilities of whites, of the unattractiveness of the African physique, and of the artistic merits present in whites but absent in blacks, end quote. So clearly, he did not believe that all human beings were created equal, or if he did, he was a hypocrite. Now today, in Jeffersonian tradition, and in the wake of the extreme dehumanization and mass murder that occurred during the Holocaust, political leaders and international lawyers began to invoke the concept of inalienable human rights, such as are enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. While the recognition of such rights and their use in prosecuting crimes against humanity has been undoubtedly an advancement in international law, there is a significant underlying question concerning the philosophical foundation for such rights, in terms of both their very existence and the enumeration of these specific rights. At the time the UN Declaration was drafted in the 1940s, a philosophical committee was established to advise the drafting committee on just what theoretical foundations, whether secular or religiously based, ground the existence of these recognized rights. This committee and others from whom their input was solicited comprised representatives of various, sometimes inherently contentious, philosophical schools, religious traditions, and political systems, from Mohandas Gandhi to Aldous Huxley. It was chaired, however, by the Thomistic philosopher Jacques Maritain. When a visitor observing the committee at work showed amazement that representatives from such disparate schools of thought and belief could agree on a list of universal rights, Maritain quipped, Yes, we agree about the rights, but on condition no one asks us why. Maritain's own answer to the foundation for such rights was, of course, to mystic natural law theory. He writes, in my opinion, any rational justification of the idea of the rights of man, as of the idea of law in general, demands that we should rediscover the idea of natural law in its true metaphysical connotations, its realistic dynamism, and the humility of its relation with nature and experience. We are then able to understand how a certain ideal order, rooted in the nature of man and of human society, can impose moral demands valid throughout the world of experience, history, and fact, and can establish for the conscience, as for the written law, 
the permanent principle and the elementary and universal criteria of rights and duties. Now granted, the concept of rights was foreign to Aquinas in the 13th century. Uh, he talks about use in the sense of just relationships, so justice, but the translation of use into the term, um, well first the German Recht and then right in, in English, that wasn't a concept that Aquinas had. Nevertheless, his natural law ethic, informed by his philosophical anthropology, provides a sound and universally applicable, if not universally acknowledged, foundation for the human rights that nations around the globe ought to strive to implement in their civil laws. In this paper, I explore a meta-level question that undergirds Maritain's and the UN's influential project. Why do human beings have the moral status we do? such that there is a normative requirement to recognize our possession of certain universal inalienable rights. Jefferson asserted that, at the metaphysical level, human beings are, quote, endowed by their creator with such rights. And at the epistemic level, the existence of such rights was self-evident. Interestingly, as not quite a Christian, but not quite a deist, something in between, Jefferson did not necessarily believe in a personal God imposing direct laws on us. And so he may have meant that our possession of such rights was simply given by virtue of our nature qua human, as opposed to having been granted to us intentionally by divine fiat. Furthermore, their self-evident existence means that they ought to be recognized epistemically by even non-theists, and the UN Commission on Human Rights included representatives from the militantly atheist Soviet Union. We can thus put the question again in a slightly different form, what is it about human beings that inherently grants us these rights? Is it simply because we are human? This smacks of collectively self-serving anthropocentrism and is vulnerable to Peter Singer's famous charge of speciesism. While some scholars are dismissive of Singer's charge or have mounted arguments against it, the warranted consideration of this allegedly prejudicial sin is evident to any fan of science fiction that depicts the existence of intelligent ex extraterrestrial life forms who seem to merit recognition of the same inherent rights we enjoy. Consider this exchange from one of the films of the Star Trek franchise, wherein members of the predominantly human federation are conversing with representatives from the alien Klingon Empire. One federation officer asserts, quote, we do believe all planets have a sovereign claim to inalienable human rights. To which one of the Klingons responds, in alien, if only you could hear yourselves, human rights, why the very name is racist, the Federation is no more than a homo sapiens only club. Now Star Trek is of course fiction, but the real possibility, actually probability, of intelligent non-human beings having evolved on other planets in this immense created universe has already prompted philosophers and moral theologians to consider what moral status such beings might have and how they might fit into, from the Christian perspective, salvation history. The probable existence of such entities doesn't necessarily detract from the moral status of human beings. Now one way of terminologically resolving this issue is simply to label all alien life forms who exhibit certain relevant su traits sufficiently similar to us as human. In fact, the term humanoid is often used in Star Trek to refer to aliens who pretty much look and act like us, except for maybe having a bumpy forehead, pointy ears, or ridges on their nose. But the descriptor human may be too well grounded in reference to the biological species Homo sapiens. Given, for example, recent research into the creation of chimeras, where human DNA via stem cell transplant is engrafted into non-human animal embryos, there's at least a conceivable possibility that, say, a primate embryo into which human neural stem cells have been engrafted could develop into a mature animal that thinks, feels, and autonomously wills just as we do. While this too may sound like science fiction, a scientist from Yale University is attempting to create just such an entity in a laboratory on the Caribbean island of St. Kitts utilizing African green monkeys. If such a being were created, would it count as an intelligent African green monkey? Or would it count as human? Such confusion of species identification is one reason that has been given for condemning such research endeavors. An alternative conceptual approach is to sidestep the question 
of biological species identification and utilize the term person to describe a sufficiently human-like chimera or an extraterrestrial alien who differs from us only in physical appearance and evolutionary morphology, for whom we find it to be self-evident to possess the same inherent, natural, God-given rights we do. After all, are not all human beings persons? Aquinas thought so, while also recognizing the existence of non-human persons, namely angels, including the fallen angels we call demons, and the members of the divine trinity. Simply changing our terminology, however, does little to resolve our central question. It merely rephrases it. Why do persons have the moral status we do, such that there's a normative requirement to recognize our possession of certain universal inalienable rights? The concept of personhood has a long philosophical history. The word is derived from the Greek term prosopon, referring to the masks worn by stage actors to depict different characters they were portraying. We still use a variant of this term today when we refer to someone taking on or displaying a certain persona, that is, an inauthentic self. The Latin term persona originally, however, referred to someone possessing legal status within the Roman Empire. Free imperial citizens were personae, in contrast to slaves and the barbarian outsiders. We still utilize the concept of legal personhood today, as U.S. law recognizes the existence of incorporated businesses as such, whereas unborn human fetuses do not enjoy this legal status. The first use of persona in a philosophical sense is in the treatises by Boethius concerning the nature of the divine trinity and the two natures of Christ united into one person. The Boethian formula of personhood, that is, an individual substance of a rational nature, was adopted by Aquinas for the same purposes, as well as to describe the moral status of human beings. So what is it about human beings, angels, even demons, and the members of the Holy Trinity that make us all persons? And what is it about our personhood that gives us the moral status we enjoy, grounding the existence of our natural rights? When Aquinas considers whether the term person is rightly ascribed to the members of the Holy Trinity, he answers that it is so because it is a term of dignity. He states, Person signifies that which is most perfect in all of nature, namely subsistence in a rational nature. The dignity persons possess is due to their having, quote, dominion over their acts and are not only made to act as others, but act through themselves. Now, God, of course, as omnipotent and as pure act, has perfect mastery over his actions. Angels, as immaterial intellects, though lacking omnipotence and pure actuality, enjoy virtually unlimited exercise of their free wills. As with angels, human beings possess freedom of will due to our intellective capacity, which in turn entails that each of us exists first and foremost for our own sake, not as instruments to be used for some other end. Relatedly, Aquinas contends that while each of us is undeniably a member of a larger society of persons, each of us is, quote, a kind of whole unto himself, with rights and duties transcending his membership in the body politic. Non-human animals, however, though sentient and capable of self-movement, do not possess a will that is free, but rather appetites driven by natural necessity and thus do not count as persons, at least as far as Aquinas knew. Later philosophical developments concerning the concept of personhood have continued to focus on a set of relatively similar traits, all which can be traced back causally to our existence as rational beings. John Locke, for instance, defined a person as, quote, a thinking, intelligent being that has reason and reflection and can consider itself as itself the same thinking thing in different times and places. Locke's definition includes the essential rational dimension of the Boethian definition, but emphasizes more the continuity of self-consciousness to ground one's persistent identity, eschewing the essential continuity of the underlying substratum, that is, the individual substance portion of the Boethian definition. He even says that if two human beings were to switch souls, and those souls, that, so if I were to take on Daniel's soul, but it's still my consciousness. It doesn't matter if Daniel's soul, it's still me, and vice versa. 
In line with Aquinas' thesis of what grounds the inherent dignity of persons, Immanuel Kant grounded the incalculable moral worth of human persons in the capacity for rational autonomy. Among contemporary philosophers, Lynn Baker contends in a neo-Lockean fashion that a person is essentially a being with the capacity for a first-person perspective. Other contemporary theorists have cited various essential activities in which persons engage, rational thought, self-reflexive consciousness, using language to communicate, having non-momentary self-interests, and possessing moral agency or autonomy. Collating all of these historical and contemporary views, I propose as a summative thesis that a person is any being who exhibits a capacity for self-conscious rational thought and autonomous volition and who is thereby a member of the moral community. Now this general definition captures the essence of being a person but omits many nuances that are often contested. For example, it is debated whether having a capacity for self-conscious rational thought and autonomous volition requires having a biological cerebrum or whether a functionally equivalent silicon information processing system would suffice. Also debate is was required to be a member of the moral community. For example, a severely cognitively disabled human being may not be a contributing member of the moral community in that she does not have the mental capacity to fulfill duties to others, but she may still be a recipient member in that she has rights which entail others fulfilling duties toward her. If a non-human animal a human non-human chimera, or an extraterrestrial alien were found to possess the above-mentioned traits, they would arguably count as persons. Perhaps even, though this may be impossible in principle, if an artificially intelligent machine were to be engineered with such traits, and not merely the simulacrum of them, it too would count as a person. Yet we still have not directly answered our central question. Consider a paradigmatic, uncontroverted case of personhood, namely a cognitively normal, mature human being. This being possesses, among other traits, the putatively morally relevant traits of self-consciousness, intellective and practical, in the sense of moral, not merely technical, reasoning, and autonomy. But why do these traits give this being her elevated moral status above non-persons? One response is that these traits are self-recognized as belonging to the only species, on this planet at least, that has the capacity to assert its own moral status. In short, the moral value of the traits definitive of persons is due to their being traits definitive of humans. While this response avoids the pejorative speciesism charge, insofar as it extends the recognition of such traits and consequent moral status potentially to non-human persons, it remains anthropocentric in origin which is perhaps all we can do epistemically with no other species of persons in the known universe to serve as a comparator. It is arguable that a person possesses the moral status she does by virtue of her capacity that comes from these underlying capacities to have significant interests, the frustration of which would cause her to experience a degree of harm beyond the pain that merely sentient, non-personal animals may experience which is by no means to deny that such animals have interests as well that merit respect to the extent that doing so does not precipitate significant harm or loss of morally significant benefits to persons. This claim takes us beyond Aquinas' conclusion that the dignity of persons is due to their capacity for mastery over their own actions, for such mastery may be exercised for good or for evil, and perhaps we shouldn't respect the interests of morally evil persons. Yet there is something correct in Aquinas' conclusion, insofar as at least within the Christian tradition, the moral status of even egregiously evil persons is considered to be on a par with their innocent victims. Adolf Hitler is as much of a person as a Jewish internee in Auschwitz, hence why it constituted a moral dilemma for Pope Pius XII, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and other Christians whether it was morally licit to plot to assassinate Hitler. Furthermore, Eleanor Stump contends that even Satan, insofar as he is a person created lovingly by God, continues to be loved by his creator, even though God knows that Satan's will is fixed and will never turn back towards loving union with him. Personhood is thus not earned through good moral acts, but rather is given by one's very existence. A question that arises at this point is whether the givenness of one's moral status as a person 
is due to having been created by a loving God that is extrinsically grounded or due to the inherent traits one possesses as a person that is intrinsically grounded. I see no reason why these should be mutually exclusive, for even non-theists typically acknowledge the intrinsic moral value of persons, however they may define such. Furthermore, Aquinas notes that God cooperates with the process by means of which human persons are produced, by infusing a rational soul into any appropriately formed body, even if there is sin involved, for example, a child conceived through the act of, an act of adultery. Today, it is evident that God cooperates with the creation of human persons in vitro, and there's no reason to think God would not cooperate with the creation of a cloned human person, a chimera who bears the inherent traits of personhood, or if possible, a truly artificially intelligent, self-aware and autonomous machine. Again, that's not to morally approve these means of creating such persons, but just the idea that metaphysically, God's gonna give them a soul if they have the appropriately formed material body. Our central concern regarding the creation of such entities should not, should not only be whether we ought to create them in the first place, but the epistemic means we should adopt to determine whether they qualify as persons and how we ought to treat them in case of epistemic uncertainty. In this regard, the teaching of St. John Paul II from Evangelium Vitae concerning the respect due to human embryos is instructive. The Holy Father states, quote, what is at stake is so important that from the standpoint of moral obligation, the mere probability that a human person is involved would suffice to justify an absolutely clear prohibition of any intervention aimed at killing in the case he's discussing, a human embryo. Now, if it's licit to remove the qualifier human before person, then the mere probability of being confronted with a person, whether human, non-human, chimeric, extraterrestrial, or perhaps even artificial, grounds a moral obligation to treat them with the same respect with which paradigmatic persons ought to be treated. Now, this previous analysis allows us to weigh in on a few disputed questions concerning the moral status of persons. Daniel Dennett, for example, contends that whether something counts as a person depends in some way on an attitude taken towards it, a stance adopted with respect to it. I'm quoting Dennett here. It is not the case that once we have established the objective fact that something is a person, we treat him or her or it in a certain way, but that our treating him or her or it in this certain way is somehow and to some extent constitutive of its being a person. Now, clearly legal personhood is extrinsically imputed, yet there are inherent qualities of the beings acknowledged to be persons that ground their recognition as such, though legislators can, of course, fail to recognize such qualities in beings who nevertheless are, in fact, persons. Dennis' claim, however, relates more to the concept of selfhood than personhood, and these two are often conflated. There's a distinction between my existence as a person and my subjective sense of my own selfhood, the latter depending to a significant extent upon my relationships with other persons. Was Helen Keller, born deaf, blind, and mute, not a person before she was recognized as one by her teacher Ann Sullivan? Clearly, Helen Keller possessed the inherent capacities of personhood, since otherwise no communicative breakthrough would have ever been possible. And this suffices for her to have always been a person. Her subjective selfhood, however, was arguably diminished by her lack of interpersonal communication until her breakthrough with Sullivan. A second disputed question is whether personhood is a threshold concept, meaning one either is a person or is not, or is personhood a matter of degree, such that severely cognitively disabled human beings might not count as persons to the same extent as cognitively, quote, normal human beings. While any one of the traits that exemplify one's personhood may be actualized to various degrees, autonomy, for example, is expressed in relation to various potentially coercive influences in one's social milieu, whether one has the inherent capacity for autonomy to any degree is a property one either possesses or does not. Self-consciousness would be another trait that appears to be an all or nothing affair. I'm not talking here about the extent to which one is aware of the subconscious motivators of their behavior, a la Freud, but self-consciousness in terms of being able to think substantive I thoughts. Lynn Baker, for example, talks about Oedipus's self-mutilation as prompted 
not by a third personal assessment of the error of having, having killed one's own father and married one's own mother, but the first personal horror of having killed his own father and married his own mother. The capacity for such rich self-consciousness is either present or not. Finally, is the value of one's personhood impersonally objective or subjectively indexed? Utilitarians hold that the value of a person's existence and interests is impersonally objective. To use Jeremy Bentham's famous dictum, each person in the utility calculus counts as one and no more than one. This allows for the interests of persons to be aggregated and for those of the majority to outweigh those of the minority. By contrast, an interest-based account of the value of personhood focuses on each individual's subjective valuing of their own interests for life, pleasure, flourishing, truth, friendship, loving union with God, etc. There are various forms that an interest-based account may take and specific applications such an account might entail. For example, perhaps allowing for a person rationally to elect suicide if they lose any subjective interest in their future life. A subjective interest account, though, is not inimical to the thesis that the very existence of a person is objectively valuable and therefore ought to be subjectively appreciated by oneself. In fact, we typically view suicidal persons as suffering from clinical depression or some other cognitive emotive defect that warrants amelioration by means other than suicide. In short, my life has objective value because I am a person, but my value as a person should not be objectified such that my life and interest may be weighed in a one-to-one -one scale with those of other persons. Violations of my interests or the ultimate harm of death are bad for me because of how they negatively impact me subjectively as a person. To conclude, I would like to apply our analysis thus far to a relatively new point of debate among bioethicists, the possible advent of post-persons, resulting from various forms of cognitive, emotive, and so-called moral enhancement. In brief, a post-person would be someone whose intellectual capacity, degree of emotional control, and consequently ability to consistently make virtuous moral choices would be an order of magnitude above our present collective capacities for such. If it is practically feasible to create post-persons one day, and if the very concept of a post-person is conceptually coherent, then bioethicist Nicholas Agar voices the concern that such entities may have morally superior needs to ours, akin to the morally superior needs we have in relation to non-human animals which would justify the potential use of us mere persons by post-persons. It would thus not be in our collective self-interest to create such beings in the first place. The validity of Agar's concern may be seen in the Thomistic principle that the less perfect exists for the sake of the more perfect. This principle justifies human persons eating other animals for nutritional purposes, as well as both humans and animals eating plants. Might it justify putative post-persons eating us? Anyone see that movie, Soylent Green? Now, perhaps culinary concerns are not what should be at issue here, but what about post-persons utilizing mere persons for biomedical research, just as we utilize, with some but limited ethical restrictions, non-human animals? Or for post-persons to restrict mere persons' reproduction if there is a shortage of resources to support everyone's flourishing? Alan Buchanan contends that even radical forms of enhancement would not produce a race of post-persons whose moral status would be categorically different from our own, such that it would be morally incumbent upon unenhanced persons to yield the satisfaction of their interests to post-persons. Buchanan's argument is based on personhood being a threshold concept, such that it would be a category mistake to believe we could create a race of post-persons who enjoy a higher moral status than we do. Buchanan and Agar both presume a Kantian definition of personhood in which the inherent moral status of persons is premised upon one's capacity for practical rationality. While Buchanan holds that the presence of such a capacity marks one as a person, regardless of how well one reasons practically, Agar contends that cognitive and emotive improvements of a sufficiently great magnitude could yield an increase in moral status. Now, it is arguable that the dignity of various types of persons may come in degrees, 
Aquinas, in fact, states that angels have a greater dignity than human beings do because of their greater capacity to exercise their wills. And yet personhood remain a threshold concept, such that the basic natural interest for life, freedom from pain, and respect for autonomy of even the lowliest persons ought not to be violated, even for the sake of promoting such interests in more dignified persons. Although I do not share Agar's concern that radically enhanced post-persons could rightfully claim moral demands at the expense of the basic natural interests of unenhanced persons, the danger of such beings might not acknowledge the equivalent natural rights of the unenhanced has already been well established by historical analogs in which certain groups of persons considered themselves to be more highly evolved and thereby more rightfully entitled than other groups of persons. Thank you very much.